Yeah. Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Can you hear and see me? Right. So the topic for today is uh, dextrocardia assessment. Now uh, this this was a topic postponed from last month, and um, I, and I hope to take it up in all its aspects today. So let's go on to the next one. Now, dextrocardia, as you all know, is related to position of the heart. Now, the first x-ray on the left here shows a normal chest x-ray, where you see the cardiac effect on the left side, as you frequently see it. And the, the important thing to note is more than the apex is the long axis of the heart, that is, the longest diameter of the heart is pointing downward and towards the left. That, that's the long axis of the heart. Now, that is by convention considered normal because that's the most common type of cardiac position and, and called levocardia. It's commonly accompanied by normal visceral situs, that is, normal position of the visceral organs of the liver, the opaque organ being on the right side of the abdomen, and the stomach as shown by a smooth tear bubble without any uh, hostile markings, just it marked the colon, this is indicates the stomach. So that is normal chest X-ray with normal itis. Dextrocardia has been defined by different people by, as uh, one related to position of the heart, that is the heart predominantly being on the right side of the chest with the cardiac apex pointing towards the right. The important thing again here is how to identify the apex. In many hearts, it's very clear as you see it here that the apex is pointing to the right. But there would be other hearts where the apex would not be so obvious. It may be a little more rounded and, and it may look as if and similar on both sides. In that case, it's important to measure the longest diameter of the heart and see whether that's predominantly pointing to the right or to the left. So the first one is levocardia. The second one is dextrocardia, which is the topic of our discussion. You would also note in this case that the stomach bubble is more is, uh, is visible on the right side and an opaque organ is visible on the left side. Therefore, the, visceral, the abdominal viscera also appear to be inverted in position and this must be a complete inversion of the, all the organs, all sides of inverses. Okay? So that is dextrocardia and that's what we are going to discuss with today. Now, dextrocardia sounds simple, but when you come to congenital heart disease in dextrocardia, there are enormous uh, possibilities. Now, let's see a jigsaw puzzle. I, mean, I hope you are all familiar with jigsaw puzzle. Here you see a number of pieces and uh, which actually produces a picture. And you're supposed to put all these pictures together and if you manage to do it, you get a complete painting. Now, that's what we do in dextrocardia assessment in congenital heart disease. This is the normal heart as we are used to, the right atrium, the vena cava, and, and then in sequence comes to the right ventricle and then the pulmonary artery. On the left side, the left, left cardiac chambers. Now, but each one of these segments are separate pieces and they've been put together in a particular sequence to produce a normal heart. Therefore, we can look upon the heart as made up of a number of individual elements. Like you have two atria, two ventricles, and two great vessels. They could be put together in any possible combination, giving rise to various anomalies. This, for example, is a normal heart. The right atrium with the vena cava connected to the right ventricle. Right ventricle gives off the pulmonary artery. The left atrium with the pulmonary veins here connected to the left ventricle, which in turn gives off the iota. So that's a normal heart. Now look at this. So now you could take apart this heart into different pieces and you can come up with this anomaly. What you get here is a right atrium connected to a morphological left ventricle, which gives off the pulmonary artery. So venous blood is going to pulmonary artery, but venous blood is also going to morphological left ventricle. Therefore, this is an example of normal cycle, right atrium on the right side and left atrium on the left side, but it's connected to the left ventricle, therefore, it's an example of corrected transposition in cytos solitus. So the, the same segments would give you a normal heart, the same segments of the heart could give you corrected transposition of great arteries. Look at this heart. 
Here you have situs inversus, that is right atrium on the left side, left atrium on the right side. But the left atrium is connected to LA, LV, and LV is connected to the pulmonary artery. So the problem, this connection is anatomically normal, but the left ventricle is giving off the pulmonary artery. So therefore, whereas the right ventricle is giving off the aorta. So this must be complete transposition, but it's not the usual complete transposition. It usual, this is complete transposition in the situation of situs inversus. Therefore, you have oxygenated blood going back into the lung and you've got venous blood going back into the aorta. So the same segment in some other arrangement produces complete transposition. It could same, the similar segments in a different arrangement would produce corrected transposition. Look at this. This is also corrected transposition, but in situs inversus. Right atrium and left atrium are inverted. LA is connected to RV. RA is connected to LV. So there is abnormal connection here. And the venous blood is going, the, the venous blood is going to the pulmonary artery and, there, and the arterial blood is going to the aorta. Therefore, anatomically transposed, but physiologically, venous blood is going and arterial blood is going to the appropriate chamber. So this is another example of congenitally corrected transposition, but in inverted position. Now I'm telling these anomalies to tell you how the different segments of the heart could be treated as pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and we have to put the pieces together to produce a complete diagnosis. So how do we do it in dextrocardia? We first identify the situs. The situs could apply to the abdominal viscera, it could also apply to the atrium. Then you identify the cardiac chambers, the atria, ventricle and the great vessels. Then you arrange the chambers and vessels as they exist in the body. That is, which atrium is connected to which ventricle, which ventricle is connected to which artery. Once you have done that, you identify the additional anomaly, then identify the physiology. The, the root of blood, that the more blood is going into the lungs, the less blood is going into the lungs, is there any obstruction. So that is the last fifth point is the physiology. Therefore, if you put all of this 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, you get the complete anatomical and physiological diagnosis, and therefore you can then plan a management. Now, the visceral situs and cardiac situs position generally go together. Therefore, if you have normal visceral situs, the heart lies on the left side. If the visera is inverted, then the heart would lie on the right side. But unfortunately, this does not always happen in congenital heart disease. Here you can see the the stomach bubble is normally placed and the liver is normally placed. The visceral site is solid, but the heart is on the right side. Therefore, viscerocardiac discordance. Now, this is another example where the stomach is on the right side and the liver is on the left side. Therefore, double viscera are inverted, whereas the heart is lying, looking normally placed in the left side of the heart. Now, when viscera and cardiac position both with each other, concordant with each other, then you usually have less incidence of congenital heart disease and the heart is relatively normal. But when we have visceral heart discordance, as in these two x-rays, that is you have visceral heart cytosolitis, but heart on the next right side, or you have visceral inversion with heart on the normal position, you almost always have very complex heart disease. So look for viscerocardiac concordance and viscerocardiac discordance. Viscerocardiac discordance means you do have a high incidence of complex heart disease. So let's come to the visceral situs. This is situs solitus. This is situs inversus. This is normal. This is abnormal, but very often associated with a normal heart. But look at this. Here you are not able to make out the visceral cycle. The liver is neither right sided nor left sided. It's a big midline liver. Could be right sided, left sided, midline. The visceral cycles is also confused. If the stomach could be here, the stomach could be here, or the stomach could be in the midline. This is a situation called cytos ambiguous. Most often, this is accompanied by atrial cytos ambiguous also. That means you cannot identify whether this is 
clearly right atrium and this is the left atrium. Both look, could look like right atrium, both could look like left atrium. So most commonly the visceral situs goes with the atrial situs. So we have normal situs here, we have normal situs. That is right atrium on the right side and left atrium on the left side. And when you have inversion here, you have right atrium on the right side and the left atrium on the left side. This combination generally does not have any major heart disease. This combination almost always has severe and complex congenital heart disease. Now, how do you identify the dextrocardia? You go sequentially, start with the visceral cycle, then go to atria, then go to the ventricle, and so on. And going to the atrium, generally the atrial cycle follows the visceral cycle. But it does not always do so. Therefore, you must make separate attempts to identify where the right atrium is and where the left atrium is. There are different ways of doing it, and I will go through that in here. First of all, you try to identify the atrial situs by, by features of the atrium itself. You can also take the help of the trachea. Uh, I'll also briefly show you the electrocardiogram and echocardiogram and other features to help you identify that. Now, the same site I told you, the visceral atrial situs rule, by and large, the stomach situs and the atrial situs go together. By and large, that means visceral situs politics go with atrial situs politics. Visceral situs inverses go with visceral situs, uh, atrial situs inverses. However, these are the exceptions. Occasionally, you cannot make out what the visceral situs is, and neither can you make out what the atrial situs is. That means uh, it doesn't fit in situs inverses or situs forward. The organs are midline, it, it extends from right side to left side, you're not able to make out, so you don't know. Then there are situations also called Heterotaxy of bilateral nerves. Bilateral nerves means both sides look right side, both sides look left side. So both are right atrium or both are left atrium. Now both are right sided nerves most commonly accompanied by absence of the spleen. This is called asplenia syndrome or heterotaxy with absent spleen, also called as bilateral right sided nerves. The interesting feature here is both the atria and the heart will look like right atrium. That means, I'll tell you the morphological features later, that means you have two right atrial affectations, you'll have two atria looking morphologically by the right atrium. Whereas the other situation is, when you have multiple splints in the abdomen, you have bilateral left right atrium, that is, both atria would look like left atrium. So these are the exceptions to the visero atrial situs rule. Situs ambiguous, the heterotaxy syndrome, that is linear and the polysplenia syndrome. Among the viscera, more than the liver and the spleen, it's the bronchi which are the most reliable guide to atrial situs. This is almost 98% to 99% uh, concordant with the atrial situs. Uh, it's again not 100%. So the normal situs is accompanied with the right-sided bronchus, which is identified by a short and straight bronchus. By straight, I mean it is more in line with the trachea. By not straight, I mean this, the left bronchus is often comes off at a right angle to the trachea. So this is the straight and this is not straight. This is a short bronchus. The length refers to the point from the point of division to the takeoff of the first upper lobe branch. Invariably, the first upper lobe branch to come off is the right upper lobe. Okay, can you see that here? Therefore, the right bronchus is short and straight. The left bronchus is long and not straight. The first, uh, now this is cytosolitis, right bronchus on the right side and the left bronchus on the left side. When it is inverted, the short straight bronchus on the left side and the long bronchus, horizontal bronchus on the right side is called cytos inversion. Cytos ambiguous could be bilateral right sidedness, that is two short bronchi, but it's symmetrical. Both of them look symmetrical, right sided and left sided. But here you have two short bronchi looking like a mirror image. Both upper lobe branch coming off fairly early. This is bilateral right sidedness or asplenia syndrome. You have two long bronchi coming off at an angle, not so straight. Long because the first upper lobe branch comes off after a long time. This is called bilateral left sidedness, also known as polysplenia. So, 
the left atrium stays on the side of the left bronchus, the right atrium stays on the right side of the right bronchus. Follow that? So, left bronchus and left atrium go together, right bronchus and right atrium go together. Now, there is another feature called hype arterial or F arterial. Hype means less or below. F means AP means above. Now, hype arterial means the left bronchus stays on top of the left coronary artery. F arterial means the right bronchus stays on, sorry, sorry, the hype arterial means the left bronchus stays below the left coronary artery, whereas F arterial means the right bronchus stays above the right coronary artery. Now, this is a bit difficult to identify on a plain x ray chest. Sometimes in a penetrated x ray, you may be able to make out both the arterial outline and the bronchus. However, in a, in a plain x ray chest, sometimes it's often difficult to identify hip arterial or hip arterial. More easy to measure the length of the left bronchus versus the right bronchus. Invariably, the left bronchus is the longer one, more than 2 centimeters, and the right bronchus is less than 2 centimeters. However, just below the age of 2 years, the length does not hold good. Then another way of identifying is to take the ratio of the left bronchus to right bronchus. If, if you have one bronchus to other bronchus ratio more than 2 or more than 2, it has to be either normal or sinus inversion. That is, one bronchus is more than twice the length of the other bronchus. It can be either normal or it can be inverted. If the ratio is less than 1.5, that means both the bronchi are similar in length. It has to be atrial isomerism. That is, it has to be bilateral right sided or bilateral left sided. If you have a ratio of 1.52, your x ray is probably not reliable. You need a, a CT, CT imaging to determine the precise length as to where the first upper lobe branch is coming off. Okay? So, the bronchial situs is the best guide to the atrial situs, almost 98 to 99%, short of seeing the atrial anatomy itself. So, if you do not have an echo or an angio, the bronchial lens is the best guide to atrial situs. However, these days cardiologists invariably have echo or CT or uh, angio facilities, and therefore, the importance of bronchial anatomy has come down. Electrocardiogram is a very poor guide to atrial situs. If you have normal P wave axis, that is, the P wave is uh, upright in uh, 2, 3 AVS and 1, that means the P wave axis is directed towards the left and downward. I think you can safely infer that it is fine. Through. If it is clearly inverted in 1, 2, 3 AVS, that is, it is going from left to right and going upward, it's probably situs inversal. But the ECG is dependent upon other factors. It depends on the rhythm. It could be a left atrial rhythm, it could be an ectopic rhythm. The abnormal heart could have two sinus nodes, or it could have a total absence of sinus nodes. Therefore, uh, in a complex heart situation, the P wave, if it is normal sinus axis, sinus P axis, it helps. An abnormal P wave axis is not of much aid because in any number of uh, abnormalities like abnormal P wave, abnormal sinus node position, abnormal number of sinus nodes, ectopic rhythm can produce a state ECG. The ECG is not a great way of determining atrial situs. Echo and angio are very important. How do you identify the right atrium? Right atrium typically receives the IVC. This is probably the single most useful criteria. The IVC almost always comes back to the morphological RA. Again, it's not 100%. It's almost 99.95%. There are few examples in which the IVC has connected to morphological LA. But for all practical purposes, if you have a chamber receiving the IVC, it is right atrium. It's also identified by its broad triangular right atrial affinity. It can be identified on echocardiogram. It can be identified on angiogram. Therefore, the appendage is a very useful criteria. You can also identify the fossa overlays on 
and I'll show you a few pictures later. The morphological LA is identified by a long finger like appendage. Unlike the, the broad atrial appendage of right atrium, that's a long finger like appendage is very narrow neck. And of course, if you identify the fossa oval is, you can always differentiate the RA from LA. So let's look at a few pictures. This is a subcostal echo you are all familiar with. And if you do the long axis of the IVC and you can trace it upwards to join an atrium, and this invariably is the right atrium. In this view, you can see the broad right atrial appendage here, the right atrial appendage. In this view, if you have that appropriate angulated, you can also show the SVC joint here. Therefore, there is no doubt this is the right atrium, both SVC and IVC and the appendage are joining that thing. And by exclusion, the other chamber must be the left atrium. Most commonly, the pulmonary vein is returned back to the left atrium. Therefore, you can identify if you can identify the pulmonary veins here, and in some other view, show the left atrial appendage. So we we'll show that this is the right atrium and this is left atrium. Now, this is a four chamber view from the subcostal window, also called the short axis. Can you see the atrial septum? Now, the atrial septum has a typical shape: the septum secundum and the septum primum. The septum primum overlaps the left atrial side of the septum secundum, and this is the fossa ovalis. The fossa ovalis forms a vandular orifice which opens into the LA. So, this typical arrangement invariably indicates which is RA and which is LA. The septum primum on the left atrial side, the septum secundum on the right atrial side. So, this now we will tell you this morphological RA and this, sorry. This is the morphological LA. Another feature of the morphological right atrium is it, it receives the corner sinus. Almost always the corner sinus returns to the RA. You can see the corner sinus in the posterior part of the atrium, it returns to the RA. So you can identify the shape of the appendage, the connection of the IVC, position of the fossa ovalis, and that identifies the morphological RA. The position of the fossa ovalis. The shape of the LA appendage and the pulmonary vein indicate the position of the LA morphological LA. Okay. You can also show the uh, RA appendage when it is malformed. You can see the broad right atrial appendage pointing to the left. So even if the RA appendage points to the left, you have to identify it by the uh, broad triangular shape. And here is the left atrial appendage, which is a long finger-like appendage. Therefore, this atrium must be left, whereas this broad triangular appendage must belong to a morphological right atrium. That's the broad triangular. Now, the abdominal uh, cross sectional echo would also help to identify the visible cycle and therefore indirectly identify the uh, atrial cycle. Here we have the normal short axis, iota on the left side of the spine and the IVC on the right side of the spine. How do you identify this pulsate? You can uh, put color Doppler to see the direction of blood flow. You can also put pulse Doppler to see pulsatile flow. So this is IVC. It will show flow, flow towards the heart. This will show aortic flow away from the heart. Now, in situs inverses, the aorta comes to the right side of the heart, right side of the spine, and the IVC goes to the left side of the spine. In both these conditions, they lie at the same level. You see that? In front of the spine. So they lie on either side of the spine. When the situs gets disturbed, as in heterotaxy, we often have iota and IVC lying on the same side of the spine. And you see here both lying on the left side of the spine. And now, both these situations, the iota, is, iota and IVC are lying on the left side of the spine. So there's a slight difference. The normal IVC which connects to the heart directly to the atrium invariably lies in front of the aorta. So this is a site of ambiguous, but here the IVC is connecting to the atrium. Whereas if you look here, the, the, the venous channel is lying behind the aorta in the paravertebral gutter. This indicates that this is not a normal IVC, it's actually a zygote or on the left side a hemizygous vein. So this position indicates that the IVC is interrupted and is continuing on the either the or the MA connection. 
Therefore, we have four possibilities situs solitus, situs inversus, situs ambiguous with IBC connecting to the HDM here, situs ambiguous with IBC interruption and azygous or azygous with azygous continuation. So on the right side, we call it azygous, so on the left side, we call it hemiazygous thing. Okay, so that was the diagrammatic representation. Here, here a real life picture cytos solitus, cytos inverses. Now, both lying on the same side of the spine, that, that bright echo is the spine. So, iota behind and the IBC in front. So, heterotaxy with IBC connecting to the atrium. This is also heterotaxy, both lying on the same side of the spine, but its IBC is interrupted and continuing as a hemiazygous vein here. Okay. So, the abdominal cross section definitely helps to identify visceral and atrial situs. After you identify the atrium, the right, right atrium on the right side, the left atrium on the left side, or whatever whatever arrangement there is, you go to the ventricle. As you know, during development, the the cardiac uh, mass, the ventricular part of the cardiac mass, moves either to the left side or to the right side, and subsequently differentiates itself into right ventricle and left ventricle. Now, for identification of the ventricular segment, we use the word D loop and L loop. So you can have a D loop when what looks like a normal arrangement. The right ventricle, morphological right ventricle on the right side and the morphological left ventricle on the left side. This is a normal arrangement commonly and some, even in some abnormal heart you could have the same arrangement and that is called the D loop ventricle. L loop was the opposite when the left ventricle lies on the left side of the right ventricle. Mind you, this is not right side of the patient. It is right side of the left ventricle. Between the two ventricles, which lies on the right side, which lies on the left side. That, that, that's what we are talking about here. So sometimes you are not able to make out right and left in the ventricle. They lie on top of each other or they are twisted around each other. You are not able to make it out. In that case, the ventricular loop would be indeterminate. It would also be indeterminate when you have a single ventricular chamber. There is no two ventricles to talk about D loop and ventricle L loop. There also you have an indeterminate situation. So when you describe the ventricle, you talk in terms of D loop and L loop. How do you identify the morphological LV? The morphological LV has a typical mitral valve entering into it. Therefore, you often have a clear fish pouch appearing. When you go down across short axis of the left ventricle, you often see two papillary muscles which identify the mitral valve and therefore the morphological LV. On the other hand, the, the tricuspid valve has three papillary muscles and you have a triangular arrangement. This has a fish mouth, uh, anthroposterior valley fettering. This typically has a triangular arrangement. Can you see the triangle here? That's the triangle with the papillary muscle in each corner of that. And therefore, this is clearly different from the two lateralized papillary muscles here. So, a short axis often helps to tell you which is the right ventricle and the left ventricle. So, the right ventricle is often trabeculated and a lot of muscle bundles crossing it. And typically, it has one big muscle bundle for the uh, trabecular two band. The divides the, the smooth part of the right ventricle from the apical trabeculated portion. And you can see there's a big, there's a, you know, dividing the ventricle into two here. Now, you can also see that the right ventricle is not clean and smooth like the left ventricular cavity, especially if these are the separate surface of the right ventricle. If you don't see a clear smooth border like you see on the left ventricle. This is a smooth surface, left and septal surface of the left ventricle. Therefore, the right ventricle is typically reticulated, especially towards the distal portion of the arm, whereas the left, the left ventricle is typically smooth. Please remember, we refer to the septal surface more than any other portion. We can see here that we have a situation where the ventricle on the right side appears to be smooth. Here, can you see this relatively smooth? Whereas the ventricle on the left side seems to have a lot of traticulations. So, here the ventricles are inverted. Yes, can you make that out? 
there is another important difference in the apical four chamber view. Normally, the mitral valve is at a higher level than the tricuspid valve. Whichever valve is at a higher level in the apical four chamber view. Higher means more towards the atrium. You can see this in this case, the right sided valve is at a higher level than the left sided valve. Now, this difference, the septum which separates the mitral and tricuspid valve in the vertical position, this is the atrioventricular septum here. Now, Whichever valve is at a higher level is a mitral, is the anatomical mitral valve. Whichever valve is at a lower level is the anatomical tricuspid valve. Therefore, this is the inverted of normal. So, you can identify that the ventricles are inverted by the offset of the mitral and the tricuspid valve. They are not at the same level, the mitral valve being at a higher position. You can also see that the left ventricle is smooth, whereas the right ventricle is trabeculated. So, the features point that the right ventricle is on the left side and the left ventricle on the right side and therefore this is L loop. This is the condition of L loop. Whatever atrium this is, this is opening into the left ventricle. Whatever atrium this is, this is opening in the right ventricle. Okay, this is an example of an L loop of the heart. Now typically Earlier, we used to use the angiogram for identifying the chamber morphology, but with the advent of echocardiography, you really don't need to look at this. But in sense, some of these patients would be having angiogram, you also know how to identify it. Look at the left ventricle. It's a typical pear shaped ventricle, typically smooth, it doesn't have too many muscle bundles. Whatever little muscle bundles you see are very fine, very fine. And in systole and diastole, you do not see many. So, the shape is important, the trabeculations are important. On the other hand, the right ventricle is a typical right triangular chamber. Look at that triangle. Both in systole and diastole, it forms a triangle. And the apical portion of the right ventricle typically has thick muscle bundles. And you see that all these muscle bundles. Trabeculation crossing entering the trabeculi and the blood goes in between the trabeculi right till the apex. So, heavily trabeculated ventricles indicate right ventricle. These trabeculations are particularly more prominent not only in the apex, but also more prominent on the septal surface. The septal surface is heavily trabeculated with the dye going in between the trabeculi here. You can see that here also, the cell and diastole. And this trabeculated ventricle is giving off the iota. So that means iota is coming off from the morphological right ventricle. That's how you identify the, the the ventricular morphology, and that's how you identify that the which ventricle is giving off which great person. So once you have identified the atrial morphology, you also identify the ventricular morphology. You have to identify which is connected to which which atrium is connected to which ventricle. You Not know the right side. Atrium is the morphological RA. Make sure it's connected to the morphological RV on the right side. Then only it's normal connection. How to identify that? Again, echo is most useful. This is a normal heart. See the heart long axis is pointed to the left. The morphological RA that must have been identified by other features I already told you by the IVT connection, the vertical connection, and all that. But that's connected to the morphological RV, the triangular chamber. You can see that the mitral valve is at a higher level than the tricuspid valve, that is the atrioventricular septum. So, this is the morphological tricuspid valve, this is the morphological mitral valve. So, this is an example of cytosolitis, atrioventricular concordance, right atrium connected to right ventricle. This is left atrium connected to morphological left ventricle, so atrioventricular concordance. If RA was connected to LV here, it would be called atrioventricular discordance. You could have LA connected to morphological RV here. It would become then again atrioventricular discordance. So you have an example of atrioventricular concordance. You can have atrioventricular discordance. That is, the RA could open into the wrong ventricle, wrong morphological ventricle. 
you can have atrial ventricular concordance, you can have atrial ventricular discordance. The other type of atrial ventricular connection can be, you can have absent atrial ventricular connection. That is, the, you could have the, both the, uh, the, one of the AV valves completely absent. This you could have that this valve completely attracting or this valve completely attracting. So that is called an absent atrial ventricular connection. So you have concordant atrial ventricular connection, you have discordant atrial ventricular connection, you could have absent atrial ventricular connection, also you can have double atrial ventricular connection. That is, both mitral and tricuspid valve opening into a same vessel. You can have examples of double inlet right ventricle and you can have examples of double inlet left. Right? That should be very clear to you. So you can have four combinations in atrial ventricular connection. AV concordance, AV discordance, double inlet in connection, and you can have absent atrial ventricular connection. That's correct. Is that, is that clear? All of you? Okay. So this is an example of atrial ventricular discordance. Can you see that? Morphological RA, they have already identified that. The mitral valve is at a higher level, therefore this must be LV. Another feature in favor of LV is the smooth ventricle. This must be RV because the tricuspid valve is at a lower level than the mitral valve. And this ventricle is trabeculated. Can you see the trabeculation here? So here is an example of AV discordant, RA to RV, LA, sorry, RA to LV and LA to RV. The example of atrioventricular discordant. This is an example of atrioventricular concordant. Here RA to RV, LA to LV. This is AV discordant, RA to LV. LA to RV. Okay, is that clear? Now, here is an example where both the atrium and therefore both the AV valves are open into one single ventricle. Now, I do not know what ventricle is it, LV or RV morphologically, we need to look at it more carefully, particularly the septal surface. But then, whatever it is, it's a double inlet ventricle. So, both the RA and LA are opening into single. This is an example of double inlet ventricles. Right, so now we have identified the uh, atrial position, particular position, and atrial ventricular connection. Then we go to the great arteries. The great arteries could be normal, that means iota coming from LV and PA coming from RV. It could be transposed, that is, iota coming from RV and PA coming from LV. It could be malpose, that is, anything which is not normal or transport is called abnormal. I'll, I'll explain that in more detail later on. And finally, you could have a single artery. There are two examples of single arteries. You could have one of the arteries being absent, like pulmonary arteries here. You would have only iota coming out from the heart. Then there is no main pulmonary artery. So that's an example of single artery. You could have iotic arteries here. No iota coming off from the heart, only the pulmonary artery coming off. Or you could have a trunker where one great artery comes and gives off the iota and it gives off the pulmonary artery. So you can have four combinations normal, transposition, malposition, and so normal, transposition, malposition, and a single artery situation. Now, how do you identify is it uh, abnormal or a normal great vessel? If you go to a single, uh, if you go to a short axis of the great vessel, normally how do you find is the pulmonary artery invariably wraps around the other artery. Now, that is that is considered normal. That is one artery wrapping around the other artery is considered normal. Whereas if the two arteries are parallel, you to identify parallel great artery, you would see two great arteries as a circular shadow in a side by side or anthroposterior, but two full circles. And that what that what happens in transposition and malposition. So let me see some examples here. Can you see that here is a normal heart in a short axis view 
at the level of the great artery. You see the aorta as a full circled here. You see that? That's the aorta. And the normal RVOT and pulmonary artery wraps around. Can you see this? It goes around the aorta like this. So this is normal great artery. If, if pulmonary artery is on the left side and coming off the right front, so the PA wraps around the aorta like this. It's considered normal site. Normal site is for the great artery. This is the normal anatomy. On the other hand, now this again is an normal. This is a line diagram for normal short axis. Now, in situs inverses, this forms a mirror image. What happens is, iota remains like a circle. The great vessel still wraps around the iota. The pulmonary wraps around the iota, but it does on the right side. This is an example of a great vessel in a situs inverses position or mirror image of the great artery. Okay, so this is normal, this is abnormal. But abnormal place, but it could have an anatomically normal heart in the inverted position. This is designated by the letter yes. Yes means situs solitus of the great vessel. This is in designated by the word I. Titus inverses of the great vessel. Okay. So normal mirror image. This is S and this is an I. Now just look at this art. This is a parallel arrangement. You see uh, two round shadows. None of the great vessel is wrapping around the other. Even at a little higher level when you try to identify the branches, this is not wrapping around the iota. The iota is in front of the P. So this is an example of abnormal position. Parallel great artery and the permanent artery is not wrapping around the iota. It's not winding around the iota either on the right side or on the left side. So this uh, abnormal position. But this could be is a transposition of malposition. The word transposition is applied only if the iota and pulmonary artery coming off from the wrong one, that is, iota coming from LV, uh, sorry, RV, and pulmonary artery coming from LV is called transposition. Malposition means all other positions of the heart other than normal and other than transposition. Okay? So normal heart would have winding great artery and the great vessel would come off from the appropriate ventricle. Transposition would have parallel great artery, but the ventricles would be inward. The ventricles would give off the wrong great artery. RV will give off the iota and LV will go off the PA. Malposition would be still parallel great artery, but here the great artery would not come off from the wrong ventricle. It could come off like a double outlet right ventricle situation. Both could come off from the right ventricle. Both could come off from the left ventricle. Or both could come off from a single ventricle. Therefore, all malposition can be divided into two malposition and transposition. That is divided. Right. Transposition is also a form of malposition, but it is separate because here the great vessels are com coming from the opposite ventricle. All malposition other than transposition are truly called malposition. What is the two elements of that? One is whether they are parallel great vessels, two, which ventricle they are coming off from. That is what differentiates transposition and true malposition. Is that clear to you? If you want, I can repeat that again. Okay? Okay. We can come back to that in a question to see what can ask me. Right, this is another example of malposition. Look at that. At a lower level, uh, at a higher level, they are actually parallel to each other. When you come down at the level of branches, they are still not winding around the, not winding around the, uh, great, the iota. So, this is an example of abnormal position. Now, whether this is to be called malposition or transposition depends upon their, which ventricle they are connected to. If this is coming from RV and this is coming from LV, this situation would be called as transposition. If both these are coming from the same ventricle, or both these are coming from RV, or if both these are coming from LV, 
the same arrangement would be called as malpose great arch okay malposition now malposition can be right sided or left sided right sided is called d malposition left sided is called l malposition so this aorta is on the anterior end to the left of the pulmonary artery therefore this is called l malposition on the other hand this could also be d malposition like here the aorta is anterior and to the right so this is an example of d it could be d transposition or d malposition depending upon the connection this could be l malposition or it could be l transposition depending upon which ventricle it is connected to okay it's a little complicated i think you should go back and revise it again and then this would become clear so if the great vessels are not winding around each other it is abnormal it is parallel great artery once it is parallel it could be transposition or it could be malposition transposition means it's coming off from the wrong end malposition means it is abnormal position but it probably is a single ventricle or double outlet right ventricle or double outlet left ventricle right more examples of malposition here the aorta is directly in front of the pa it's also called it could be slightly anterior and slightly to the right you could call it a d malposition but if it purely anterior some people like to call it a malposition here the aorta is anterior and to the left typically seen in corrected transport generally corrected transport of great artery okay l malpose aorta you could also identify single artery in sarco can you see this here one big artery but once you go above the valve you see the aorta is going off here and the pulmonary artery is coming off here how to identify pulmonary arteries is by division we trace it further it would divide into right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery and how do you identify aorta it would arch around in the form of an aortic arch so this is an example of single outlet single outlet in the form of a truncus the other form of and this is also a truncus you see the big vessel overriding the vfc and is giving off the pulmonary artery here and aorta here this pulmonary artery because you see the right pulmonary artery and the left pulmonary artery this if you trace it further it will lead into the aortic arch so this is an example of a truncus which is an example of single great artery coming from the ventricle other forms of great single vein artery coming off are the pulmonary artery and aortic artery here. so next we identify the great vessel position which are pointed to identify which ventricle is giving off which artery so you trace the ventricle into the great artery so this is a subcostal short axis as you as you come anteriorly you see the right atrium connected to the right ventricle the typical morphological triangular right ventricle which is giving off the pulmonary artery so this is a normal heart r a r v to p and trace it that is the connection you can also throw color doppler flow into the pulmonary artery this this pulmonary artery because it divided into rpa and lpa here and here when you go posteriorly you see the morphological lv giving off the aorta which is leading into the arch so this is an example of normal ventricular arterial connections right now ventricular arterial connection can be normal it can be transposition it can be double outlet ventricle or it can be single outlet i just told you that in short while ago so normal transposition double outlet and single outlet what do you see here here you have a morphological rv again short axis of the subcostal window you see morphological rv because very trabeculated moderator bands Here the smooth septal surface of the left ventricle. This is LV, this is RV, not out the ball. And you can see that the straight great vessel not dividing, going to the arch. Therefore, the aorta is coming out from the RV. If you put color Doppler, you would be able to see the flow going into the aorta. So this is an example of transposition, right? RV giving off the aorta. Now the same heart, when you tilt a little more posterior, you can see the morphological LV. Smooth, smooth ventricle, no trabeculations or very fine trabeculations. giving of the pa which is dividing into a rpa and lp again you can confirm it by color doppler which whether the pulmonary artery or not. so this is an example of transposition 
you could have both the PA and the iota coming out from the right transition, then it would become double outer right transition. You could also demonstrate iota and the palmar artery coming out from the left ventricle in a given case, and then it would become double outlet left ventricle. So you really have to identify each chamber and trace each chamber as the blood flow so as to identify what is the what is the sequence of uh, connection. So there's one word called position, there's one called connection. Connection indicates the flow of blood, right atrial blood flows into the right morphological right ventricle. The right ventricular blood flows into the morphological great vessel taking to the body, that's the aorta. So like that, you identify one is position, the other is connection. So each one of these terms are extremely important in describing a dextrocardia heart or any 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 uh, complex anatomy. Now look at this. Uh, here you have in the inverted position. You have the very trabeculated ventricle is on the left side. This this is the moderator band morphological RV here. The smooth ventricle on the right side. Okay, and this is the right atrium. It's already been identified by uh, subcostal like one other view. Now, if you look carefully, this morphological LV is giving off the pulmonary artery because it's dividing into RP and LPA here. And the morphological RV is giving off the iota. So, this is also a transposition, but it's a slight different. If you notice that an AV discordant, right? Right atrium is giving off the LV. Of the PA. So, venous blood is going from right atrium to the pulmonary artery. So, physiologically, it is transposition. No. Yes, physiologically, uh, it is. No, it is not transposed. Physiologically, it is corrected. Anatomically, it is transposed. Anatomically, it is transposed because the pulmonary artery is coming from the LV. But physiologically, it has been corrected because the venous blood is going to the lung for oxygenation. Whereas the oxygenated blood is coming into RV and going to the aorta. So this is anatomical transposition that is physiologically corrected. It is also called congenitally corrected transposition of data. Of course, echocardiogram also tells you about associated anomalies. Can you see the ventricular septal defect here? So that is the next important part of the cardiac anatomy description is once you have identified the four segments sequentially, you must identify associated anomalies and try to identify the flow of blood through that. So, once you have done the full job, it actually breaks down into these components. You have a visible situs, you have a atrial situs, you have a ventricular group, you have a great artery relationship. Now, it is conventional to describe the complex heart in three letters. So, you could have situs solitus, D loop ventricle, and normal position of great artery. This describes a normal heart. But mind you, this is not enough. These three letters are not enough. You have to describe both associated as anomaly, the position of the great vessel, and extracardic anomalies, and finally the hemodynamy. Therefore, you could have any number of combinations with these three letters. You could have inverted atrium, a loop of ventricle, and inverted normal data. This is the typical position of situs inverted dextrocardia of the normal heart. This is also normal heart in the solicit position. This is a normal heart in the inverted position. This represents congenitally corrected transposition, site of solitus. It is site of solitus, but connects to the RA connects to the LV and the LA connects to RV. And the iota comes from, from the morphological RV and the PA connects to the morphological LV. The, L, the iota is often L mark. So this SLL. Congenitally corrected transposition. So that's how you code it, code it. But these three letters are not enough. You must actually give a descriptive report of the ventricular loop, the great artery relationship, and the AV connection and the ventricular artery connection. So although all these may look simple in a normal heart, in the abnormal heart, each one of these components can be dissociated from the other. For example, situs and situs may be dissociated, atrial situs may be dissociated from the ventricular situs, ventricle may be dissociated from the arterial situs. So each one of them can move separately and therefore it is a jigsaw puzzle which you have to put together to bring them into one complete diagnosis. Now the second line 
only describes the position. It's important that you identify which atrium is connected to which ventricle, which ventricle is connected to which great artery. Connection. This is different from relationship. Very important. Once you have done this, you have to describe the associated anomaly, the extracardiac anomaly, and very important to identify hemodynamic. Whether there is pulmonary stenosis, whether there is ventricular septic effect, whether the pulmonary blood flow is large, whether the pulmonary blood flow is small, whether there is AV valve incompetence, whether the iota is normal, there is co-optation, there is obstruction anywhere else. So, once you describe all these points, you, you get a total diagnosis. A complete description of dextrocardia is not complete. It, it, the, a description of dextrocardia is not complete until you have described all these features because all these features are important to plan the management. Okay, I think that's the end of my slide. Now I've kept five minutes for myself to ask the question. Uh, I can't hear your questions. You must click type in your box and if I see that I'll I'll give you my answer. Yes. How much of first of all let me know yes or no. Uh, have you identified, have you understood my talk? Or is there any part which you didn't understand? I can go back and repeat it. Yes, come on, quick. I really want, okay, yes means you understood, yes, okay. I, I get another yes here, Amon, thank you, Amon. One more yes here. Okay, now let me ask you a direct question. Is there any part of the talk which you didn't understand? If you can identify that, I can repeat that or I can answer that question if you ask me a question. If there is a common AV valve, I can't, uh, I can't see the whole box. Let me make it uh, full, full size. Yeah, can you, can you type that, show me the question again? I didn't get it. If there is a common AV valve, I can't read the full question. You, how to identify the septum? That's what you're asking? How to identify the vent, uh, ventricular morphology? Okay, if you have a single AV valve, now, is this, notice that for, when it comes to ventricular morphology, and for atrial morphology and the great central morphology, we have described many features. Now, not all those features would be seen in every case. For example, atrium has an appendage, it has a vena cava entering, it has a fossa ovalis. So you may not see all the features in every case. Therefore, uh, for example, the AV valve helps to, what is the AV connection in a common ventricle? Okay, common ventricle, you could have both AV valves opening into a common ventricle called double inlet ventricle. A common ventricle would also have uh, one AV valve being absent. You could have absent right atrial connection. You could have absent left atrial connection, left AV valve connection. Now, you could have a common AV valve. So, now, it depends upon if the common AV valve is draining both the atrium into the ventricle, into a common ventricle, it is double inlet ventricle because both the atrium are opening into the ventricle but you will have to identify specify that double inlet with common AV valve you have to describe it double inlet because both atrium are in, inletting into the ventricle but both inlet through a common AV valve you have to describe that right you could have double inlet right ventricle you could have double inlet left ventricle, you could have double inlet common ventricle. Now, double inlet does not necessarily mean you have one tricuspid and mitral valve. You could have a common AV valve opening both the atrium into the ventricle. That's also double inlet. Okay? So, you have to describe that double inlet could be a common AV valve, double inlet could be two AV valves also. So, what you are just telling is both the atrium entering into one ventricle. I thought you had discussed. Is that clear? 
Right. Any other questions? Identification of extra code affinity. Yes. Uh, now, that is not part of dextrocardia. It could happen in any uh, complex anomaly. Now, the word dextra, dextra, dextraposition means normally the two atrial appendages uh, are lateralized. That is, uh, one lies on the left side and one on the right side. Typically, right atrial appendage right, lies on the right side and left atrial appendage lies on the left side. Now, right side of what? It, it, it hugs the base of the heart. That is, the iota and the pulmonary artery. So the two atria come on each side of the base of the heart and hugs the heart like this. So if you see a normal heart, can you see my hand? The two atria would be hugging the iota and pulmonary artery on either side. The on the left side would be a on the left side would be a left atrial appendage, or the right side would be a right atrial appendage. This is a normal position. Now sometimes both appendages would come on the on the same side of the heart. For example, I have a left left atrial appendage here. Okay. Now this appendage also comes on the same side below the other one. You see that? Both here both are showing on the left side. You could also show both on the right side. But this is called extrapolation. Okay. Now whether it's called right juxtaposition or the left juxtaposition depends upon which atrium has moved over to the other side. Okay. So you could have a right atrial appendage juxtaposed to the left side. So it is then called juxtaposed right atrial appendage. It is juxtaposed to the left side. That means both morphological right atrial appendage and the morphological left atrial appendage are lying on the left side of the base of the heart. The base of the heart refers to the iota and pulmonary artery. Okay. When both the appendages lie on the right side of the heart, that is, the left atrial appendage has come to the right side, it is called juxtaposed left atrial appendage. That means the left atrial appendage has juxtaposed to the right side of the heart. Is that very clear? So, now juxtaposition is another additional complication when it comes to the uh, description of the complex anomaly. I didn't go into that because Dextrocardia itself is complicated, but when you want to describe the atria in full, you also need to identify the appendage. Now, appendage is only one feature to describe the morphological atria. Okay, therefore, if the appendage is just opposed to identify atrial situs, you go by the other features, like the site of the fossa oval is, the size, site where the IVC is connected. Okay, you use those features to identify the atrial situs. Do not use the the atrial appendages. What's my point? Yes. Okay. If, any other questions? 